Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. I recognize that many people who previously have been carrying on a lawful pursuit are going to be inconvenienced. I know that. I regret that. I apologize for that, but that is the basis of our decision. And it has been taken, ladies and gentlemen, because we believe not just because of those tragic events at Port Arthur, they were the culmination of a long series of events in this country which have demonstrated, as has been demonstrated in other parts of the world, that there is a clear link between the volume of powerful weapons in the community and the extent to which they are used in an indiscriminate manner. I don't pretend for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, that the decision that we have taken is going to guarantee that in the future there won't be other mass murders. What I do argue to you is that it will significantly reduce the likelihood of those occurring in the future. People have argued that one of the great weaknesses in the present system and one of the causes of mass murder is that we have an approach to mental health laws that are too permissive. I've come here today to explain to you as directly and as simply as I can the basis of the decision, the reason why we have taken it, the reason why, however reluctant you may be to do so, to accept that it has been taken in good faith by the government in the belief that it will add to the overall safety and good of the Australian community. That is the greatest and ultimate responsibility of any government, of any Prime Minister of this country, whatever his political stripe, is to take decisions that if he believes or she believes will benefit the overall national good. That is the reason behind this decision. Welcome to I Can Murder a Podcast. It is the audience vote. You guys vote for this case. Ben, how are you doing? Oh, very well. Terrific, actually. Yeah, very well and terrific. The two at once. You can be any feelings at the same time, and that's why I am very well and terrific. And over to Dan. How are you doing, Dan? Very good. It's morning time, which is different. I love it. Oh, we've all had a bloody coffee. We have. We have indeed. And we're ready and raring to go with this episode. As I said, it's the audience vote. It's the Port Arthur Massacre. You guys picked it. It won. Did it win by a landslide, Ben, would you say? It was, considering how neck slight and neck avalanche. Has been a slight, yeah, a, a, a mere downfall. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a bag of shingle. Yeah, it beat it by a bag of shingle. Yeah. yeah. And did you know much about this case before researching it? I'd heard of it and I'd seen a few people request it before, either on Patreon mm. or in a comment section. Didn't know a thing about it and yeah. now I know a lot about it. And I think I saw the infamous, oh. infamous interview. But yeah, for years yeah, ago, okay. I didn't really know, didn't know that it was linked to this case. So um, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting one. I can't wait to share it with you guys. And just a quick reminder, guys, on our store we have released the casualty stock of the t-shirts and the sweatshirts, and they're priced at half price. Mm. So get them while you can. Yeah, get and they're, ava- you can. they're available in all sizes because uh, stock is an issue for us at the moment. But the casualty ones got got plenty of anything. And spooky season just being around the corner, guys. We've got a spooky little bundle available exclusively now for the next few weeks over at the store, which is. ICMAP.store? <laughs> Sorry, I was watching Tom. <laughs> which is over at ICMAP.store. You'll find yourself a spooky little Halloween bundle, which includes a mug, a candle, and a tote. Because a tote. A tote, it, it has to be, you know, we're like, totes have to be in there. Yeah. So uh, we put it in there as well. So. And also, it, for your trick or treating, that would oh, be bloody great. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. 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 Like that, Ben. Always yeah. think outside the box, aren't you? So, yes. <laughs> and also because because yeah we are talking about halloween we, we have got i bought the guys some uh wiggly worm sweets uh warheads uh, apparently not as sour as, as they wanted so they weren't a bit disappointed with me but flavors are great we're not even sponsored by warheads but there you go
And also, guys, by the time we're recording, we're going to be reading the cult applications next episode. So please do get them in because we're very excited to welcome people into the cult of ICMAP. Yeah, I'm excited about that. But at the time of recording, the episode where you've told them about the cult isn't live yet. Yeah, so, so we've got no emails. Yeah, we've kind of really... We've got some emails, but they're a bit... But we're very excited to welcome people into the cult of ICMAP. And this week, it's the audience vote. And uh, how we've arrived there is by the Instagram followers deciding the case. So if you're not already, why not follow us on Instagram, Twitter, at Could Murder a Pod. We've also got TikTok, Facebook. Just search I Could Murder a Podcast and we will pop up over there. But we've got two more big episodes after this week. And you'll know all about it if you're following us on one of those social media platforms. And just a reminder, when this series is done, we'll still be continuing posting on Patreon Minnesota's during our break. So if you want to see more content during that time, that's the place to find us but Ben enough of our waffle so today's case the Port Arthur Massacre do you want to say the other names it goes by yeah it's also uh, referred to as the Port Arthur shooting it's also I mean more globally than in Australia because they don't like to say his name but it's also referred to as the Martin Bryant case and the worst massacre in modern Australian history as well as the crime that changed Australia forever so similarities to last week's episode in terms of the Hungerford Massacre back to back massacres which has been research wise fairly intense yeah it is it's it's one of those things where there's so many deaths it kind of just doesn't feel real doesn't when you're reading it yeah. and you're hearing all about it martin bryant is i hate to use the word fascinating but he, he just feels very different to a lot of people we've covered i feel and guys we like to start the episodes with a quote about the case so ben would you like to take it away so this comes from robert wainwright's book born or bred martin bryant the making of a mass murderer Martin John Bryant slipped into the world in the autumn of 1967. Blonde, blue-eyed, angelic. On a sunny Sunday 29 years later, he loaded the boot of his yellow Volvo with guns and ammunition and returned to Tasmania's historic Port Arthur settlement. His crime, the world's worst killing spree by a lone gunman, horrified the nation and changed Australia forever. And now we're going to look into the early life of Martin Bryant. So Martin John Bryant was born on the 7th of May 1967 in Hobart, Tasmania. Tasmania being the southernmost state of Australia, he was the oldest of two children born to Maurice and Carleen Bryant. Martin had a younger sister by the name of Lindy. The family raised Martin in the quiet suburb of Lena Valley, which is located to the southeast of the island of Tasmania. Almost half of the island is a national park, with many lakes, bays, mountains and forests. Lena was originally known as Kangaroo Bottom, later Kangaroo Valley and also Safravas Valley. (laughs) Safravas? Sassafras. 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 Later, Kangaroo Valley and also Sassafras Valley. <laughs> Sassa. Later, Kangaroo Valley and also Sassafras Valley. Well, I can understand why they changed Sassafras Valley. Yeah. Sassafras. Sucker and Sassafras. <laughs> Lena being the Aboriginal Tasmanian word for kangaroo. The family also had a beach home in Carnarvon Bay, which Martin spent large parts of his childhood at. Tasmania in general, though, is pretty interesting. Oh, is it? Yeah, roll it. Ben Carter's interesting facts. Interesting facts. Are oh, they? I don't know. Interesting facts. So Tasmania is basically Australia's version. I mean, this is a loose comparison. I don't want to there we go. offend anyone, but it's basically Australia's version of the Isle of Wight for the UK viewers and listeners. And it was initially called Van Diemen's Land by British settlers in 1803. So they decided to use the island to transport uh, British prisoners to. And due to the very harsh and isolated island environment, they basically turned it into a bit of an Alcatraz or Guantanamo Bay. They essentially felt that nobody would be able to escape the island to the north South, east and west, it was it was covered in water. <laughs> <laughs> it was an island. Uh, but yeah, just really treacherous ocean. <laughs> Fuck me. It's not like you really, Fuck. That's a word, there's originals. <laughs> so they formed the town of Port Arthur to use essentially as a convict settlement. They built up large prisoner bases there, with many of the original buildings still standing to date. You can also, which I found a little bit interesting, you can also find native British plants and trees on the island, unlike any part of the mainland. Did the convicts take some seeds in the pockets? Seed, yeah. On the shoes? Scattered them. Yeah. Mm, as in, yeah. like, sit at the bottom of the sole, you've got a bit of seed in there. Yeah. In all of that, I had to ask myself, where does the Tasmanian devil come into all of this? Looney Tunes Taz was inspired by the real-life Tasmanian devils, which I think basically look like little rat pigs. Little rat pigs? Little rat pigs, yeah. I think yeah. that's doing them a bit of a disservice. I think they're quite cute. Mm, Mixed. Sure. Some are happy-looking, some are very steer-clear of them looking. Um, oh, rat pig is mean. Is it? Yeah. Sorry, They're guys. quite cute. I'm just looking Are at they? them now, yeah. Wouldn't want one as a pet. They can be quite... Probably not. They've got sharp teeth, it yes. looks like. Mm, I don't know what, what I would say they look like more, but... Rat pigs is all right. Or did I say pig rats? You said rat pig. Oh, well, I've written pig rats. It's like a dog It's like a dog mixed with a rat. Dog rat, yeah. Mm. 
Well, for a large portion of time, they were only found on the island of Tasmania. Taz, the character, was created in 1954, initially as a, a villain character to oppose the uh, the tricky Bugs Bunny. Oh, I didn't know it was the villain. Yeah, mm. yeah. Taz was my favourite. Taz is is a cool character because mm. he blubbers and has that like really raspy noise that he makes, but then he can come out with some quite comprehensive sentences, which I can relate to. Interestingly, Taz, the character Taz, has been voiced by 14 different voice artists. I thought you'd like that, Danny Boy, being in the biz, including Brendan Fraser and Mel Blanc. A little bit more. It's a, it's, it's a bumper edition of interesting facts. It really is. I mean, some of this I actually <laughs> am finding interesting because yes. last night you voice noted me. Oh, no, don't play it. <laughs> Which one is it going to be? This is a real Russian I'm so excited. This is, really is a Russian roulette. Fuck. I'm just not feeling so factual right now i'm just not feeling so facty <laughs> i ain't feeling so facty right now <laughs> you hear what i'm saying <laughs> maybe it's not me maybe it's the fact <laughs> but then i sent him one after i woke up <laughs> there's another one yeah ben then this morning so i was like oh no the facts mm. we're not going to get the facts that people want. <laughs> And they sent me this this morning. I woke up feeling factual, baby. <laughs> baby. I got facts spilling off of my tongue. I got factual facts, facty facts, motherfucking facts. I'm feeling super facty, <laughs> brother. Sometimes me and Ben do voice notes as if we're wrestlers. Oh, and um, yeah, that was yeah. So I, I was, I, I was like, oh no, he's not gonna. I couldn't sleep. But oh, he's not gonna have the yeah. facts. And then that one this morning, I was like, okay. But yeah. I'll probably say best, best facts so far. Fantastic. Well, you're not even done yet, so <clears throat> this might ruin. This is where it gets a bit heated, actually. Ooh. I wasn't aware of this. In 1997, the Tasmanian government and Warner Brothers went to court regarding the rights to use the character Taz. Basically, the island wanted to use the character as tourism promotion, That's which nice. I understand. Yeah. Warner Brothers weren't as keen, which I, I don't understand why. So basically, Warner Brothers turned around and said, you can use Taz, but you're going to have to pay a small fee. And it Tasmania, wouldn't be small fear, but no, oh, the, the brothers of Warner, no, no, no in there, um, cash everywhere, bugs money, <laughs> bigs money, yeah. <laughs> It would be bad. So the Tasmanian government refused to pay a fee to Warner Brothers, but still used Taz to promote tourism. So a bit of a, a strenuous relationship there. Years later, when the actual animal was at risk of going extinct, the Tasmanian government asked Warner Brothers to financially support them in their efforts to research and prevent them from going uh, extinct. After many years back and forth, Warner Brothers produced 5,000 limited edition Taz plush toys, and they sold them with all proceeds going to research against the DFTD disease that was killing off the animals that's a nice little touch from them i mean like yeah. don't know why back and forth for over years that kind of ruins it a little bit They're yeah like, we need this now but, um yeah <laughs> they're dying yeah but at least they yeah. you know they stepped up in the end yeah taz was also in an episode of scooby-doo it's not in the <laughs> crossover it's not in there but i thought about putting it in there so quite a lot this week apologies for that can you do a taz impression oh it's got because it sounds like there's like an electric whisk going on in the background and they'll blah, 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 bzz, brr, there you go. But then he comes out with like a comprehensive, like, he will say words as well. I don't remember he? the words. I remember. That's dead. What for you bury me in the cold, cold ground? I remember the noise you just did. He does those noises, but then he would all, all of a sudden like... What's the noise again? I don't want to do it twice, oh, okay. I would just replay it. <laughs> Slow motion, maybe. <laughs> But yeah, he came out with some quite um, articulate sentences. I don't remember them at all, but maybe that was later. I yeah. think that might have been the later one. He ones. grew up, yeah. Art the Taz series when it was him living with his family. I'm uh, getting him mixed up as well with Muttley. Okay, yeah. Because um, Taz lived with his family, and then the younger brothers are a lot cleverer than Taz. Oh. And it's a bit like... A bit like um, Martin Bryant. He could say that, but um, we'll get back into <laughs> the childhood. Martin's father, Maurice, worked as a waterside worker. Worked on various ships and docks, helping to transport cargo to and from local ports. Whilst his mother, Carleen, worked in a chocolate factory around the corner, up until a couple of weeks before Martin was born. <laughs> so immature. From a very early age, Maurice and Carleen felt that they knew Martin was different, claiming that even as a toddler, they would come to his room to find many of his toys smashed to pieces and that new toys purchased to replace them wouldn't last five minutes with Martin. 
His mother would describe Martin as annoying and different. And these two words, even in interviews with her, annoying and different from multiple different people keep coming up to describe Martin. As a baby, Martin would reject any attempts of affection. He would push people away from him when they tried to hug or kiss him. As soon as Martin had the ability to walk, he would regularly escape the family home and run away into various woodlands and mountains that surrounded the family home. He would do this so regularly that his parents eventually decided to put a harness onto him, and they would often fill his bedroom with brand new toys in order to serve as a distraction for Martin. So potentially rewarding misbehaviour from a very early age. They also placed a stake in the ground of the front garden and surrounded it by toys, harnessing Martin. Neighbours would frown upon this. So yeah, it's... it's uh, that's a bit strange. That's like a, very essentially. Strange. Like, I said a bit strange, but that's very. Strange. That is very strange. Yeah, I mean, it's when you were saying things about giving them a brand new toy and then him ruining it. I was immediately thinking of Sandy, my dog, and then having a thing on the ground is very, it's very much treating him like a dog. Yeah. But Carly and the mother would claim this was entirely necessary. If he is running to escape, I mean, what are your options? You got your options of fence off the garden. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, very passionate about a fence. The thought just came to me. <laughs> but still, then he, I'm sure he can. F- he would figure a way over and out of Probably. it but so you know it's hard do you lock me in a room that's uh, that's his harness worse. as a um climbing rope that you think in a way is for him to escape yeah oh, okay I'm in the wrong park now so was he but yeah i i feel sympathy for the parents in the sense that yeah i don't know how you would actually go about it if your child was trying to escape all the time i don't actually know what the proper procedures would be there at school martin would be bullied due to the fact that the other children found him odd and difficult but in turn he also bullied other children as he felt that this would help him fit in better martin exhibited many strange behaviors at school including sneaking up on children he didn't know and jumping on them so just kind of giving them a bit of a fright do you like to surprise people men a little bit of a boo a little no. bit of a creeper in the corner just blended in just, just blended in regular guy Father Carter. Carter, Father Starter. Charter. Breaking other children's backpacks. That's a bit... I'll be That's annoyed at that. Much, yeah. Throwing food at other children, pulling a snorkel from the mouth of other children whilst diving and spitting I, at other children in class. I'd be annoyed about the snorkel. That's enough to put you off snorkeling forever if that if you're deep down enough and that happens. Oh. I remember snorkeling in the pool in Florida and my brother just putting his finger down the snorkel. And that was horrific. However, he was in turn severely bullied himself. He's being bullied, he's bullying, he's not accepting affection, he's wanting to run away from his, his parents. So yeah, there seems to be some inner turmoil definitely there. Yeah, absolutely. Teachers described a young Martin as constantly demonstrating erratic behaviours. They noted that he was distant from reality and unemotional, but also full of aggression and had within him the ability to be violent to other children. During this time, Martin would also be physically violent too and bully his younger sister Lindy. One particular school psychologist said that Martin would never be capable of holding down a job as he would aggravate people to such an extent that he would always be in trouble. So too annoying to be employing Martin. In a way, kind of. I I see what you mean. In 1977, Martin was suspended from Newtown Primary School at the age of 10. However, by the age of 14, Martin had an IQ that was lower than 98% of the population at his age. He would return to school a year later and his behaviour did start to improve. However, his new thing was to pick on children in the first year of primary school, with most of the children that he picked on being half of his age. Mean, isn't it? My my mum made a point of the IQ, she was like, you can't compare other people's IQs because the IQ test changed over the decades, so then you can't say... For sure, Kemper's smarter or all dumber than That's Ted a good because point. it changes, their scoring changes and how they do it. As a result of this, in 1980, Martin was sent to attend a specialist education unit in Newtown High School. However, these seemed to have the opposite impact on Martin as his education and his behaviours would continue to deteriorate over the years. It was around the age of 10 that Martin began torturing animals. He would regularly catch, torture and kill cats, rabbits and rats. He also once shot a parrot and mutilated its head, you know, from... All the cases we've done, this is obviously a very distressing sign. I mean, it's distressing anyway, but it's a distressing sign of what is to come. In a later interview, Martin's ex-girlfriend would claim that Martin had told her he had sex with a young horse. (laughs) Another bizarre hobby that Martin had was cutting down trees on his neighbour's properties. He would regularly sneak out at night or in the early morning with a chainsaw and try to saw down a tree before being spotted. It's just very annoying behaviour. I mean, the animal stuff is is just damn right cruel and horrible. But this behaviour... Especially Dan, can you imagine if you woke up and there was the, like the kind of town annoying kid, little mm. prick in your garden cutting down a tree? I'd be literally flipping fuming. Even if it was that spooky tree in the corner. All right, mate. <laughs> it is spooky looking, though. It's a good tree. It's, no, it's, it's a great a tree. Strong tree. Just, yeah, strong tree. It's yeah, great and strong. Yeah, but just yeah. spooky. It's, just, it's annoying behavior. Yeah, it is. 
and you know, chainsaw, if you want to be subtle, that's not the way to go. So Martin was referred to mental health professionals at the ages of 7 and 11 due to his harassment of the other children, but also due to several people informing authorities that they had seen him torturing animals. But no further action was taken. But you've got to ask there, surely. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's still obviously... He's then, very young still. But then that's even more reason to intervene, you would have thought. So psychological assessments of Martin revealed that he had a possible intellectual disability and was also potentially on the autistic spectrum, but he certainly had Asperger's. When Martin was 12, he badly injured his hands and chest by playing with fireworks and even ended up on local television, being interviewed from his hospital bed. So we'll pop that, that clip up for you now. Do you think you'll be playing with firecrackers anymore? Yes. Don't you think you've learned a lesson from this? Yes, but I'm still playing with it. And obviously, yeah, when asked if he would uh, play with fireworks ever again, he almost immediately and very confidently says, yeah. Yeah, he does sound he, just like that, didn't he? He did sound exactly like that. He, yeah. was, he was, did understand why he would not, which um, you would have thought the burns would be enough to Yeah, hint. always remember the adverts on telly back in the day about Bonfire mm. Night, and they were always horrific. Do you remember the show? I, don't know, I, think, I think I might have brought this up on another podcast. I guess it's gotten oh. to that stage now where we've... Our podcast? Yeah. Oh. I do you remember the show Nine Nine Nine. Yeah, and uh, there's one episode about fireworks night where one of the sticks fell from the firework and landed in someone's eye. Oh, so I used to oh, want. Yeah. I remember saying to mum, I wanted to wear sunglasses when we went to the fireworks display, and she's like, "You're probably not going to see it." I was like, oh, "My eyes." Um, I remember that advert that they used to have that was specifically, "Don't throw gas tanks on bonfires." Why they had to make tanks. a specific, like you know, those little portable barbecues. It was, I think, it was aimed also at festival goers. Oh, it was, yeah. Because someone somewhere had thrown a full one onto a onto a. It's red and festival. They used to show it. And yeah. Like, think it's funny, do you? And it pans <laughs> out, and you see his face, and it's like with the stitches. I just couldn't be laughing. <laughs> yeah. Don't find it hilarious. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> think it's funny. Ben does. It was, it was, it was, <laughs> you think it's funny, do you? <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. It, yeah, not funny. So we've talked about Martin to this point, very, very socially unaware, didn't have any friends, um, would stick very much to himself. But one local neighbourhood boy who could stomach being around Martin was a child named Greg. So Greg would see Martin occasionally at weekends and the pair would explore local woods and bays together. However, Greg decided to sever the friendship immediately when Martin pierced Greg's hand with a fishing spear gun. Yeah, that is... Ouch. You think it's funny, do you? Pierce my hand on the... Spike! <laughs> yeah, not a way to make friends. No. So as a teenager, Martin was a loner who struggled to fit in. He couldn't understand why people didn't like him. He couldn't understand why people didn't make time for him. He decided the world had something against him and this would remain in his mind for the next several years. He became more of a recluse as a teenager and ended up dropping out of high school at the age of 15. So just before Martin dropped out of high school, his father Maurice purchased him an air rifle at the age of 14. Why do parents do this? Mm. Why do you, if you have someone who's, you know, you've son like, he's cutting down trees in the early morning, he's killing cats and animals. Maybe mm. don't buy him an air rifle. Yeah, this was the same case uh, last week with the Michael Ryan. But then he wasn't displaying this kind of behaviour to this extent. Like, mm. uh, fair enough, he was, I mean, he, he used a rifle to then shoot a cow in a field. Mm. But before that, he was, you know, he was being physical to his but mother. No, no, I agree. He was probably, he displayed less concerning behaviours yeah. compared to Martin at this point, certainly. So the gun absolutely thrilled Martin and became obsessed with taking his guns to the garden and to the local wooded areas for target practice, spending almost all of his time with this gun. Martin became a fairly accurate shot, something that is quite discomforting. He found the first thing in life that he was really good at. So on different podcasts I've listened to, different documentaries I've watched, they talked about he would always go down to the local creek with his gun and he mm. would hide in the woods waiting for joggers to go past, dog walkers, and he would just take pot shots at them. How this behaviour isn't reported at this point yeah, is, exactly. punished. It's, it's wild. Baffling. So after dropping out of high school, Martin worked a series of odd jobs, including as a gardener and a handyman, Martin's mowers. But he, he just laid that out. Yeah. Okay. But he received very little custom from locals who were aware of him. I'm not letting you mow my lawn. You shot my dog. No, you that's... Cut, you cut down the fucking tree, can <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, uh, the, the local neighborhood very aware of him wanted to steer clear of him and again in turn that's probably making him feel even more rejected by society yeah. even though it's kind of of his own doing kind Definitely. of he also used to skin rabbits that he killed with his air rifle and attempted to take them door to door to sell the kid that's you know been troubling the, the street walking down with skinned rabbits just in his hand going door to door mm. and apparently he would knock but he wouldn't just he would gaze into the, the kind of doorway look oh. into the house a bit it's, it's, it's horrible horrible image as a result, Martin was assessed for a disability pension, with the assessing psychiatrist noting the boy cannot read or write, does a bit of gardening and watches TV. Only his parents' efforts prevent further deterioration. Could be schizophrenic and parents face a bleak future with him. 
<laughs> Imagine your parents it's getting just a, that. Yeah. You are you're going to fi- find your future gonna, with him bleak. It's, it's going to be a struggle. That's quite a, a, an overview of him. And as a result, Martin was approved to begin to receive a disability pension. So when Martin was 19, he was out trying to onboard more customers for his lawn mowing service when he met 54-year-old multi-millionaire Helen Mary Elizabeth Harvey. So Mary was the heiress to the Tattershall Lottery Fortune and lived in a large mansion in Newtown. The pair immediately struck up a bond and would go on to become inseparable, essentially becoming best friends with one another. Martin would become a regular visitor to the Harvey Mansion. Now this is a big, like very peculiar friendship. Yeah, I found because when we, when we researched the childhood... I got about halfway through and then this happens mm. and then this just took a whole new tangent and Phil, um, our animator, amazing work, has done just the most disturbing still of these two yeah. together. So well, for the audio people, come and check out the visual episode this week because it's it's even looking at that without context makes me a bit a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, it's a very du- weird dynamic in itself. I mean, a 54-year-old multimillionaire and, you know, a troubled, troubled 19-year-old. I mean, we're going to go on to discuss it, but Helen herself had her own difficulties and putting them together was just, a, I think you couldn't get an odder couple. I mean, they yeah. they would go on to say there was nothing like sexual or anything between them. They literally were just best friends. Mm-hmm. It was a platonic friendship. So Mary wasn't your typical millionaire. She was incredibly eccentric and lived with her aging mother in their new town mansion, which was kept in a hideously poor condition. She was said to have incredibly poor personal hygiene and also made very impulsive purchases with the family's money. She employed Martin to help with the lawns and help to look after the family's many pets. Now this is, imagine this. Yeah. I mean, fair enough, it's a mansion, but they had 14 dogs living on the property, mainly inside the house, and 40 cats living yeah. in the garage of the property. Mansion or not, that's too many. And is that the case that she started off with like four mm. and just let them do their own thing and then over the years? I mean, the cats, with 40, I can't imagine. Yeah, imagine. That's a lot but of the, cats. The, I just the smell, you can smell that. Yeah which is horrific. So Martin absolutely loved Helen um, and the freedom was mutual. In the summer of 1990, an anonymous person reported Helen to the health authorities and upon further investigation from arriving medics, this is disgusting, this part, Helen was found to have several untreated and infected ulcers and her mother, Hilza, had an untreated broken hip, which had been broken for almost two years. To combat this, Helen made her mother, Hilza, sleep in an upright position on a chair in the family's kitchen. Hilza was immediately rushed to hospital and treated. She was then placed into a nursing home, but unfortunately died several weeks later at the age of 79. The arriving medics also reported Helen to local authorities regarding the state of the mansion and health concerns over the many animals it kept. A clean-up order was placed on the decaying mansion and, perhaps as a sign of how close Martin had become with Helen, Martin's father Maurice ended up taking long-service leave from his job in order to help clean up and restore the mansion together with Martin. I think at this point, regardless of how much trouble Martin has caused his parents at that point, maybe there's some part of the parents thinking, hang on a minute, quirky millionaire, they bloody love Martin. We're in here. Well, yeah, I think the idea of like, I think you would cross the mind of he's, he's not our problem now. But also, yeah, I guess it's keeping him out of trouble to an extent. But and it wouldn't last for yeah, very long, yeah, will I it? Mean, so. I'm not throwing any fire at uh, Maurice or Carlene um, at this point. But I imagine he would have been very difficult to raise. So after the cleanup had been completed, Helen invited Martin to live with her in the mansion. Martin and his parents agreed to this. So the 23-year-old moved in with the 58-year-old. As Hilza was no longer present, Helen invited Martin to help her spend some of the family's fortune. And they quickly began spending their money erratically on extravagant purchases, including more than 30 new cars. Mm. In less than three years, that's nearly a car per pet. And multiple houses and properties, including farms and barns. I don't know where they could park them. The garage was full of fucking cats. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I know all these barns and farms. Well, that's true. It's such an odd relationship, isn't it? So as Helen and Martin spent the majority of their time together shopping and eating lunch at local restaurants, Martin was reassessed for his disability pension. This time, the psychiatrist noted, Father protects him from any occasion which might upset him as he continually threatens violence. Martin tells me he would like to go around shooting people. It would be unsafe to allow Martin out of his parents' control. So he's 23 at this point. They've clocked that he's been going around saying he wants to cause harm to people, literally saying shooting people, isn't this a time to slightly intervene in some way? Baffling. So in 1991, the RSPCA confiscated many of Helen's animals, noting that no animals could be kept on the property. So Helen and Martin purchased a 72-acre farm called Taurusville, which was in the town of Coppin. But they weren't copping off with one another. Locals found the pair to be very odd once they moved in, with many of them becoming uncomfortable at the pair's behaviour. First of all, when I when I first listened 
uh, to other podcasts about this. I thought it was Touristville, and I was like, mm. that's quite a rubbish name for a cool place, if it's cool. Um, <laughs> but it's Taurusville, like the uh, like the Zodiac sign. Yeah, or like the Pokemon. Or like the... What's the Pokemon? Taurus. Is that... Oh. The bull. Oh, very cool. Which obviously is based on the Zodiac sign. Right? Yeah. But then moving into uh, the, the town of Copping, I imagine most of the locals thought or assumed that they were mother and son. How wrong they were. So neighbours in Copping recalled that Martin always carried an air gun with him and often fired it at tourists as they stopped to buy apples at a stall on the highway, which is just, yeah. It's creepy, isn't it? Yeah, he also as well, his outfit of this time, despite the fact that he was, uh, you know, in the uh, in the company of a multimillionaire, he would always wear white overalls and just place a red cardigan over the top of them. He liked to wear a cravat at times, didn't he? I'll get to that, yeah. Oh, we'll get to that, sorry. Yeah. So talking about outfits, big shout out to Gully Garms for dressing us this series. Uh, we dressed up in, I've got, well, Ben's got a fish, a swordfish, and I've got a marlin. tiger on the t-shirt, a marlin. Is that a marlin, everyone? Don't know. And then uh, there's some lovely overshirts as well. So don't forget to go over to Gully Garms and use our codes, Kill Ben. And kill Tom for 30% off your purchases. There's lots of great guns over there. Yeah, we've been buying a few extras on the side as well. Yeah. So why not? And use can the I code? just say, I've got some stats just in. Oh, oh. Uh, Kill Ben is running at 600% more than Kill Tom. So I am now starting to worry about that, that though. Yeah. 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 But that is that people supporting me or okay. wanting to kill me? For the sound of that, my code hasn't been used at all. It has. It has. Guys, I mean, as I said, I don't know. I take it as a win that you use an either of the codes, but obviously it is a competition, so Ben mm. is absolutely kicking my ass. Yeah, um, there's just a lot of people killing me now, which I'm thinking about more. I'm sure if the code was, go on, Ben, it'd still be the same, Ben. I'm you sure. reckon? I think it would be. I don't think people are using it going, take that, Ben. <laughs> just going to hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we appreciate anyone using those codes, but yeah. if you can, please kill Tom. <laughs> um, anyway... <laughs> Back to, I don't want to be 600%. That's a lot. That, yeah, that does that sound. does feel personal. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the case. So he would um, regularly roam about the town with uh, you know, his air rifle strapped to his back and he would shoot tourists. He would also, late at night, roam around the neighbourhood looking into surrounding properties and any houses that had dogs in the gardens that started barking at him, he would begin to fire his rifle at them. Locals avoided Martin at all costs despite his many attempts to befriend them. This is the weird part because he did make a lot of effort to try and strike up conversation, talk mm. to people. It wasn't like he was isolated, loner, recluse by choice. He often tried to talk to people, but I think so many people were just absolutely terrified of him that they kind of made small talk and vanished. It's difficult to feel, obviously feel any sympathy for him, but because the behaviours he's doing, you'd be shooting at the neighbourhood dogs and you're talking to them the next day. Oh, is yours? Is that yours the dash hound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's the leg? What? No. I have. So Which not... apple you buy? <laughs> How'd you like them apples? <laughs> that would have been, yeah, I should have. That's all right. So on the 20th of October 1991, Helen was unfortunately killed in a car crash when a car veered into the wrong side of the road and collided with another car head on. So there are a lot of different opinions about how this happened and why it happened, as Martin was also in the car with her, but he survived the crash. Helen even asked in her will that Martin be buried next to her when he dies. So Martin was hospitalised as a result of the crash with serious injuries to his back and neck, but he made a full recovery. And during the time of his recovery, he was interviewed several times by the police as many believe Martin played a significant part in the crash. They believed this for two reasons, predominantly. So number one, Martin had a known habit for lunging from the steering wheel when Helen was driving and they'd already had three accidents as a result of this. She often told people that was the reason why she never drove faster than 40 miles per hour. Martin said about this, he was like, he felt he didn't do it for any particular reason. He just lost control. He suddenly the urge to do it. He grabbed the steering wheel, lunged to it. The fact that that odd. is a known habit, <laughs> yeah, it's that, just yeah. And also, and please don't link this to the fact I was late this morning. But at one point, I was approaching a roundabout and I, I slowed down to forty miles an hour. That's still fast. Like if she's limiting herself to forty, <laughs> that's too fast to go. To well, it. no, I was well, well, well approaching the roundabout. Oh, okay. But I still thought at forty miles an hour. I could still easily get some air on that roundabout or if I went straight into a lamppost, that would be enough to sort of ruffle me up. So her limit into 40 miles an hour, I would have limited slower if I had Martin in the car. Yeah, that's fair. And number two, Martin was listed as the sole benefactor in Helen's will and inherited over 550,000 Australian dollars worth of assets belonging to Helen as a result of her passing. 
Martin basically stood to inherit a large amount of money if in some bizarre accident, Helen passed mm. away. But also she had listed not only him as the sole benefactor in her will, but she also had a request that when he passes away, he be buried next yeah. to her, which he apparently was complicit with. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting because I don't believe that he was lunging at the Wisteria World to try and kill her. I generally think he had some love for her and he yeah. was the best friend. And, you know, he was, he was lonely and I think... He enjoyed his time with her because if he he wouldn't have spent years upon years going to restaurants with her, yeah. doing all this stuff with her, spending time with her, unless he did actually have some feelings for her. So like yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't actually think he actually had anything to do with it. I, I agree. Him. I agree with you completely. So after Helen's passing, Martin's father Maurice took over and began to look after the ranch in Copping, uh, Taurusville, and Martin moved back to the mansion in Newtown. The police eventually dropped their interest in Martin as it was evidence that he only had a vague understanding of the financial implications at hand. So yeah, just as Tom said, there was no kind of ill will wished upon Helen at all. And he also didn't understand that he was due to inherit the money. So mm. he, he couldn't quite comprehend that. As a result of his inheritance, his mother Carleen offered and was also appointed as a member of a guardianship order, which basically placed the money into the control of a board of trustees. The guardianship order was said to have been vital based on Martin having diminished intellectual capacity. So basically this this uh, board of trustees could allow how much he had, when mm. he had it and what the purchases yeah, were so for. Yeah, kind of pocket so, money, but also in the way they wanted to have the money there for when they pass on, yeah. he's going to have the money there to be looked after as well. Yeah, absolutely, to moderate his his spending and and it worked uh, for a period of time this is where i started to feel really really sorry for maurice so throughout all of this time i mean martin's an adult now but throughout all of this time uh, in the background maurice had been struggling silently with his own mental health issues for many many years and he actually began to take antidepressants not long before he began looking after taurusville so i imagine all the hardships of of raising martin obviously different issues with his mm. behaviors the worry and anxiety you must have about your Constantly, child yeah. yeah you wouldn't be able to switch off would you he also so then made the decision to transfer what was basically a shared bank account between him and his wife, all of his shared assets into solely his wife's name. Yeah. So all of his uh, assets went into Carlene's account. And just two months later, on the 14th of August 1993, after Maurice had seemingly vanished for a couple of weeks, a neighbour decided to go to the Taurusville property looking for Maurice. Once they got there, they found a note saying, call the police, pinned to the front door, and they found several thousand dollars in the passenger seat of his car. The police officers arriving at the time found no reason to suspect criminal intent. So another interesting thing about this is that just days before Maurice went missing, he would regularly leave the family home and go up and, and look after the ranch in Taurusville. That particular night, he would always just call them to let, him know, yeah, to yeah. let them know that he'd arrived. That night, he called his wife, and told her he loved her. He called his daughter, Lindy, told her that he loved her, didn't call Martin. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. It's very um, telling, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So a, a search begins uh, to try and locate Maurice or, or potentially Maurice's body. And during this particular search, Martin arrived in Taurusville. He wasn't too worried about the fact that his dad yeah. was missing. And he even began asking female police officers out on dates whilst they were looking for his father. Yeah, he's laughing, joking around and just kind of being a bit creepy on the sides. Yeah. And if your father's gone missing and there's a worrying note, it's yeah. absolutely baffling behaviour. Yeah, and he, again, socially completely out of his depth, not very aware of, of how he's behaving, what he's doing. So as a result of this, police were looking at him very kind of... Yeah, as you would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So police searched Taurusville for Maurice uh, without any luck. So what they ended up doing was actually because the property was surrounded by a, a, quite a large body of water, they called in police divers. So police divers were called in to search four water dams that surrounded the property. And on the 16th of August, Maurice's body was found in the dam closest to the farmhouse with a diving weight belt around his neck. Police described the death as unnatural and it was ruled as a suicide. As a result of this, Martin inherited the proceeds of his father's superannuation fund, which was valued at 250000 Australian dollars. So with that as well, I mean, he also, uh, some of his um, tablets were seen to be taken, like a large amount yeah. of tablets were taken before he was in the water. So, because at first when I heard about the weight, yeah. I, didn't think, I thought that's what people do when they're trying to hide a body. Yeah. But I also don't yeah. understand really why he's gone out of his way to, if he's taken the tablets... Mm -hmm. Gone to the water and then like even laying there and then when he's kind of 
collapses, you know, it's taken him down. Unless he's doing that as a measure just to make sure he dies rather than hide the body. Maybe that is it. So if 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 you go with the wanting to end his, his own life angle, what I felt was maybe he's sitting towards the end of a pier or something like that, doesn't want to experience the drowning, so takes the sleeping pills, has the weights already strapped to him, falls into the water, peaceful death. Because it was like a lot of pills. It wasn't it like they had a box of thirty pills on him, but only less than half of them were still in the box. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just yeah. I've not heard. But again, if it was someone else, yeah. you could very easily empty half a box and yeah. So it's an interesting one, and very much the local police based on his behaviour, as well as the fact that he didn't really have that much of a, a warm relationship with his father. They did initially suspect Martin perhaps had some involvement, but Definitely, again, yeah. I think also Martin was again not aware of the financial implications and his behavior was just very very i mean like uh, we've covered before i mean controversially the menendez brothers is the behavior around those kind of things with like around the death they were laughing and smiling and stuff like that so people as we always say cope with things in different ways um but this you know when he's not sure where the father is hitting on police women seems very very yeah. very odd so martin seemed to be fairly emotionless at, at his father's passing he quickly sold the touristville um location for one hundred and forty three thousand uh, aussie dollars they kept the new town mansion but while selling the Taurusville property martin's behavior seemed to unravel to the locals in the coppin area whilst in downtown coppin the white overalls that martin habitually wore when walking around with his air rifle were replaced with clothing he felt to be more in line with the newfound financial status now that he was alone martin's outfit choice became more bizarre he often wore gray linen suits coupled with a cravat lizard skin shoes and a fedora whilst carrying a briefcase during the day telling anyone who would listen that he had an extremely well-paid career i would have believed him if he's wearing that outfit but it just sounds like he should be in Dallas <laughs> a cravat I mean a cravat in the day to day um, outfit is I'm just imagining um, when they take Dwight to, to buy that model that he wanted to buy and he walks yeah. in with a pipe and the cravat I think he's wearing like a dressing gown but yeah cravat lizard skin shoes and a grey linen suit I can confidently say I don't think I've ever seen anyone pull off a fedora well, we could try one week maybe I don't want to wear a fedora no. with these headphones I'll... we could get one for Jacob now that he's hatless. Yeah. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. The hats are out of stock. <laughs> yeah. So Martin also often wore an electric blue suit with flared trousers and a ruffled shirt to the restaurant he used to frequent with Helen. So here's a question, boys. You have to wear one of those outfits. Are you going with the electric blue flared trousers suit or are you going with the grey linen suit, cravat, lizard skin shoes and fedora? I'm going for blue, blue suit. Oh, I was going to go for that. Well, you well, both wear it. No, okay. there's, there's one of each. No, no, we'll both go together. Wearing the same fedora. One you, of you will be naked. You wear the fedora. And nothing else. I'll be wearing the ruffled... No, I'll be wearing the whole suit. Le there's one electric blue outfit yeah. and there's one nice little grey linen well, number. Well, you said I'm having the electric blue and he's having the suit. Oh, perfect. I thought he wanted the electric blue. He's just... He took him one on the chin. <laughs> so the restaurant owners now get a bit spicy about Martin talking about his outfit. It was horrible. Everyone was laughing at him, even the customers. I really felt suddenly quite sorry for him. I realised this guy didn't really have any friends. They don't actively laugh at someone just wearing a bit of a crazy outfit. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of what he's seen. I mean, it might have been Dallas, like you say, but like, what what's inspired him to think this is going to help me? Well, the ruffle shirt and the blue shirt is very Austin Powers, but this is before Austin Powers, isn't it? So yeah, so yeah, very very odd. So with both his father and best friend Helen dead, Martin became increasingly lonely and increasingly isolated. And from 1993 to late 1995, he visited various overseas countries 14 times. So he loved the idea of of travelling. It's probably like he, think, he thinks that's what a rich person do. They, they go traveling yeah. around the world. Yeah. Martin is said to have hated the destinations that he traveled to as he found that the people there avoided him just as they did in Tasmania. However, and this is where I did, this is the only time I felt a little bit sorry for him, but then he immediately makes it creepy. So he enjoyed the flights as he had the opportunity to speak to people that sat adjacent to him who had no choice but to be polite and talk back with him. And these are long-haul flights. These are like Australia to America, Australia to Europe. Because he would get there and you know, he'd stay there for a few days and he'd book like a, a couple of weeks, be like a few days, oh, actually, now I'm going to go back. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, he enjoyed the long flights so he could just people couldn't leave and they had to speak to him politely. He would later go on to take great joy in describing some of the more successful conversations that he had 
with fellow passengers. And I just think that's, I feel, I feel so bad. This is where he makes it a little bit creepy. Um, creepy, I think, not a little bit, just, just out and out creepy. <laughs> so on one particular long haul flight to America, a young lady sat next to him. They engaged in conversation throughout the majority of their flight. I mean, that's the last thing you want as well. If you're on a plane for 12 oh, yeah. hours, headphones on, I'm going to sleep. Definitely. He is ready for a chat about life. So this female sits next to him chat away for a majority of the flight when they're landing and waiting to get off the plane she heard him call his mother and say i've met the girl i'm gonna marry she's probably hoping i hope it was in europe and not on this flight <laughs> but yeah that very odd behavior i imagine it's one of those calls that intentionally he wants her to hear it mm. no you see the wrong text message and you text the girl when you're going to be texting your friend about the date you're like oh you know you got on really well i really like her oh whoops i didn't mean to text you <laughs> And they're like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I yeah. think it went well. I think it went well as well. Go, oh, really? Did you mean to send that to me? <laughs> they're like, no. I'm talking about the date when I'm before I met you. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. In late 1995, Martin became suicidal after deciding that he had had enough. He said that just felt more people were against me. When I tried to be friendly toward them, they just walked away. Although he had previously been little more than a social drinker, Martin's alcohol consumption increased rapidly. His average daily consumption was estimated at half a bottle of Sambuca and a bottle of Bailey's. That's which is a horrible mix. It's a horrible, horrible... I mean, Sambuca, but anyway, me personally, yeah. that... I'll one. have a Bailey's. If but, someone yeah. else is, I don't really go out my way for one. Yeah, but then... I bet the Bailey's was inspired by Helen. And I yeah. Bet, and Sambuca. Yeah, I, I don't that. really know what Sambuca was. Or is the only thing left on the long haul plane trolley? Yeah. Little miniatures of Bailey's. And he'd also drink port wine and other sweet alcoholic drinks, which I imagine a hooch or something. He did have an on and off girlfriend, though many believe that she simply chose to be with him due to the amount of money that he had. His girlfriend's name was Petra, and she met Martin after seeing an advert he had placed for a gardener for the mansion. Interesting, isn't it? Full circle, really. He yeah. started off as the mansion gardener. She didn't do a lot of gardening. She Maybe she was thinking, maybe in a few years' time, I'll be advertising for a gardener. Yeah. For someone who's not completely stable, if that, that is fair to say, isn't it? He is not completely stable yeah. at this point. He's inherited, you know, and back then, you know, he's got about 800,000 Australian dollars. That's God knows how many million now. But he stayed there. He's not, you know, that's a life-changing amount of money. He's yeah. still kind of living the same life to an extent. I mean, I know he went on to spend money on scuba gear and, and ammunition and stuff like that, which we'll talk about. But he didn't like, I had the flights around the world, I guess, but he's not mm. made a massive, like, if, if that's me, I'm going to go like off the grid for a little while oh yeah yeah like maybe the scottish highlands oak framed house in the in the woods off the grid and uh maybe a few years later you wouldn't go off the grid maybe you like the idea of the off the grid yeah i like and the idea and <laughs> maybe a few years later you'd, you'd get be a search, package you'd be searching hashtags for places to go take pictures of instagram <laughs> hashtag search yeah oh i might try that do it we did it when we're in new york where's good places to take instagram oh, i did that for food that was i you. did it for the food that's you and I that's the best slice that's literally best slice but yeah, anyway, I'm off the grid, a couple of years, people wonder where I am, and a package arrives for you. You'd have blown yourself up before you could send the package. <laughs> oh no, I forgot to sign it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about just uh, his state of mind in the build-up now to the Port Arthur massacre. So according to Martin, he first had thoughts of conducting a mass shooting three months before the Port Arthur massacre, and had slowly been building up an arsonry as well as an action plan in the 12 months building up to that fatal day. So he would spend thousands of dollars on scuba gear, surfer gear, and hunting gear. And at this point as well, he grows out his hair very long. He likes the idea and the the look of, of the surfer lifestyle. Yeah. However, he would only sit on the sand and never actually go into the water. So he's lost his best friend in Helen. He's lost his father. He's very much on his own with the exception of his girlfriend. He's built up a great deal of resentment. Despite all of this money now, it, it can't buy him happiness. Mm. And he spirals completely out of control and begins to plan his own mass killing. Yes, yeah, so this takes us to Sunday the 28th of April and 1996, but also it's worth noting that on um, March 13th, 1996, the Dunblane massacre happened, and it's so six weeks prior, and some people believe the news of this really kind of inspired him to do something similar himself. So, so a lot of people yeah. believe that's what kind of was the final thing that made him go, that's what I'm going to do. So before we jump into the timeline for this week's case, we want to say a massive thank you to our friends over at Dead Happy. Now, Ben, we're in a cost of living crisis. I'm not sure you're aware of that. Oh, I'm very aware. But we don't want to be in the cost of dying crisis too. You're exactly right there, Tom. That's because Dead Happy only care about who you are now and not who you're going to be in 25 years, which is a, a scary thought. Let's have a think of what we might look like. In 25 years? Yeah. A couple of silver foxes, maybe. 25, so what, how, you'd be... Ooh. 
Same age as you. <laughs> yeah, depending on the month, I'd be the same age as you. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So we appreciate right now people are watching their pennies wherever possible, but it's still really, really important that you're covered. And the guys over at Dead Happy Life Insurance make that as simple and as affordable as possible. And it is very simple to get set up over at Dead Happy. A few simple questions. And if you already have existing life insurance somewhere else, it's very easy to move over to the real place. Absolutely. So the you 25 years from now will be thanking the you today. And I'm still thinking about what we might look like 25 mm. years from now. It's, it's a scary thought. In fact, it's terrifying. But it's a less scary thought if we imagine the fact that we are both insured yes indeed yeah if we weren't fully insured yes, yes completely yeah. insured to the gills so why not head over to deadhappy.com and use our code murder for three months free and start living safe in the knowledge that you are covered not only will you be supporting yourself and your future self but you'll be supporting your friends here at i could murder a podcast and we appreciate you very much and back to the episode so yes then we're going to go into the timeline of the poor Arthur massacre on Sunday the 28th of April 1996, Martin Bryant's alarm goes off at 6am, which is an unusually early hour for the 28-year-old. His girlfriend, Petra Wilmot, stirs next to him, dazed and confused as to why they have been woken up so early. Martin doesn't give her an explanation, but the two of them get up, shower together and eat breakfast. I believe it was honey on toast, which is an interesting thing to have on toast. I've never heard of that. Uh, it's fairly standard, I believe. But the more you know before Petra leaves to visit her parents. Once Petra has left, Martin packs his car with a large sports bag containing various firearms and ammunition, as well as attaching his surfboard, which he has no intention of using, to the roof of his yellow Volvo. So yeah, it's very odd. He, he was known to drive around with a surfboard, go down to the beaches like we said before, but he didn't surf. Just sat on the sand. Just an odd flex to do, just, like, just all for the look and then just... It's yeah. very odd. It's like someone having an acoustic guitar in the house and they play. Definitely. That wasn't, actually, that wasn't actually a DAU, but... Well, I'm going to learn. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Mine's it's an electric acoustic as well. Thank you very much. At approximately 9.45am, Martin sets his house alarm, gets into his car and sets off on the 90-mile journey towards his destination, the historical site of Port Arthur. And for anyone that doesn't know what Port Arthur is, it's essentially a very well-preserved convict site, which is now an open-air museum. It attracts a lot of visitors. 250,000 per year, Ben. That's a lot. That's a lot, it? yeah. Due yeah. to the historical draw of the place, as well as the surrounding nature the site has to offer. So after Martin left the property, he would make a few stops along the way. He went to petrol station and bought a cigarette lighter. He went to a different location and bought some tomato sauce. And then he went to one and bought a cup of coffee. But he stopped along the way three different times. And he also bought £15 worth of petrol. So the police afterwards believe he did this to kind of play with them a little bit. What's the significance of him buying ketchup on this day? And it's just... Which is quite elaborate for someone of, of such a low IQ. One thing we will get into is just how he loved the kind of cat and mouse playing with the police. Mm -hmm. It's something he seemed to absolutely thrive in. That part is very odd that he managed to do that. And I think you've got a quote of something he actually says to someone during these kind of interactions. Yeah, so he's also placing himself at all these different scenes. He's trying to interact with a lot of different people. And one of the last people he saw before moving on to the cottage, uh, well, has alleged that Martin said something along the lines of, I'm going to the Isle of the Dead to shoot some wasps. So WASPs was a, a, an abbreviation for White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And the Isle of the Dead is a small island graveyard not far from Port Arthur, which is accessible via the ferry. So yeah, quite, quite a statement there. He also made quite a few inappropriate comments about overseas tourists, particularly Japanese tourists. So yeah, he's placing himself at lots of different scenes here before moving on to the cottage. At around 11am, Martin arrives at the Seascape Cottage, a guest house run by married couple David and Nolene Martin. Martin has a personal vendetta against the Martins as he believes them to have maliciously purchased the property before his own late father, Maurice, was able to do so. They were obviously managing Martin's assets, but this particular guest house was one that Martin's father very much had a fondness for and, and plans of purchasing. So Martin believes that the impact of this event helped to drive Maurice to his death three years earlier and therefore blames the couple. So just before 12.30 lunchtime, Maureen and John Arthur pull up to the Seascape Cottage thinking that they'll take a look at the property as a potential staycation destination. They are met by Martin in the driveway and are immediately struck by his strange demeanour. They ask politely whether they may be able to look around the guest house, but Martin tells them that they can't because his parents are away and his girlfriend is inside the house. It's a bit odd for a 28-year-old 
to be like, you can't look because my parents aren't here. Yeah. My girlfriend's inside. Very weird uh, answer to yeah. say. I don't think they were buying it either. I think no. they, sent, they sense a strange vibe from him, certainly. The authors are made to feel uncomfortable by a strange and rude attitude and decided to leave at approximately 12.35pm. They have unknowingly had a lucky escape. So what the authors didn't know was by this point Martin had already claimed the lives of his first two victims, David and Nolene Martin, who now lay dead inside their own home. Martin casually jumps back in his car and continues on to Port Arthur. At approximately 1pm, he arrives at the Port Arthur car park where he pays the entrance fee and becomes argumentative with the on-site security guard when he is told he cannot park down by the buses. So this was a particularly busy day for the museum itself. Yeah, the, the car park was pretty much overflowing, but Martin was insisting on parking down by the tourist buses. The security guard advises Martin to park in the area designated for cars, to which Martin appears to adhere to in the beginning, but the security guard watches on as Martin clearly changes his mind a couple of minutes later and proceeds to park in the bus area anyway. The security guard watches as Martin pulls out a large sports bag from the boot of his car and observes how he carries it into the cafe with him. Apparently, yeah, he was going to the passenger side of the car, going to the boot of the car, going back to the driver's mm. side, very kind of indecisive about what he was doing or if he knew he was being watched, maybe again, yeah. he was toying with them a little bit. But eventually he pulls the sports bag out and heads into the cafe. It's quite erratic behaviour, but I don't think you would, obviously you wouldn't assume anything sinister from it. You just think this guy's a bit odd and you'd leave it as that. So it was a busy Sunday lunch sitting in the broad Arrow Cafe at Port Arthur and Martin makes his way over to the till to order his meal. He chooses to eat outside on the veranda and makes his way to an empty table, placing the sports bag on the floor next to him. He's overheard making loud comments to no one in particular about there being a lot of wasps around that day and there's a significant lack of Japanese tourists. None of the other customers pay much attention to him and go about their days, leaving Martin to finish his lunch in peace. Apparently as well, he had a gigantic portion of food and he'd, when the yeah. person serving him said, well, that's a, you know, that's a big portion, he'd made a comment about, oh yeah, I've been, I've been surfing all morning, I've got an appetite for it, which is just... <laughs> So once he has taken the last bite of his massive meal, Martin leans back in the chair for a moment, observing the busy tourist site, before casually bending down to the sports bag on the ground and lifting out an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. He takes aim at the man on the table next to him, pulls the trigger and shoots the victim directly in the neck. Martin then stands up and walks into the cafe, shooting with a mix of open fire and targeted individuals. He shoots casually with the gun at his hip, whilst customers and staff run for cover and throw themselves upon one another in order to form a protective shield. One man notably stands up and shouts towards Martin, no, no, not here, but Martin simply ignores him, takes aim and shoots him fatally. Tourists in the surrounding area initially believe that there must be some kind of historical reenactment taking place, but this thought is soon challenged when they hear the screams coming from the cafe. So just for some uh, context here, the Broad Arrow Cafe is a large cafe that's kind of sits adjacent to the car park as well as the open air museum. And it's a big patch of ground with multiple entrances and multiple exits. Martin has essentially placed himself in the busiest part of the grounds at that particular time and you can only imagine the scene it's, it's the majority are older adults but there's children and young families there as well which is just absolutely hideous back inside the building martin has positioned himself by one of the exits blocking anyone from running to safety he takes a sweeping look back around the carnage in the cafe before making his way towards the gift shop area in the first 15 seconds of the attack martin has shot and killed 12 people and injured many more which is absolutely staggering to even process yeah and as, as you mentioned there with the reenactment thing that there's reports of a lady who was walking along and the basic bullet hit just on the floor in front of her and she was so impressed by all oh, this reenactment it's so how are they able to do this how does it look so real yeah but, which again it's just terrifying but it's just that's the last thing in people's minds is something like yeah. this will be happening but a place like that as well it's un it's unusual mm. compared to you know other events we've covered definitely yeah so as the gift shop door to the main veranda is locked the customers who were in there when martin initially opened fire have taken shelter where possible and are frozen in fear when they see martin making his way towards them. He shoots the two cashiers on duty before turning back and heading towards the cafe once more. He picks out his target and shoots without a second thought. Yeah, like you said, it's the amount of people in this short amount of time and the amount of damage that can be done with a semi-automatic rifle. It's just, who needs that? <laughs> and just like day to day. So he decides to swing back round to the gift shop and shoots three more people before then heading out to the cafe's veranda, randomly firing shots off into the distance without a single cause for concern for those bloodied and dead behind him. Within the five minute time span that the attack is taking place, Martin has murdered 22 people and severely injured 12 more. Five minutes to kill tw 22 people is 
absolutely hideous. And yeah, he was apparently just cold and calculated, walking around slowly. People were pretending to be dead and, you know, just doing anything they could to survive. And he's just walking around, no mercy whatsoever. One survivor has said that he, Martin sort of, he was so calm, he, he stood over someone that was attempting to hide beneath one of the tables and literally said, nobody gets away from me before firing mm. a fatal bullet. It's, yeah, it's, it's hideous. And no, nobody knows what they do unless they're in that situation. Course, so yeah. if you try and run, try and hide, play dead. Uh, and yeah, that number of people as well is, is just horrific. Just after 1.30pm, the first emergency call is placed, with lots more flooding in in close succession. Martin steps away from the veranda and makes his way towards the coaches, where his car is conveniently also parked. He stalks and taunts people running for cover in the car park, who try in vain to hide behind and on buses. Martin decides to swap weapons and makes his way over to his car and pulls out a military-style semi-automatic 308 FN rifle to continue his attack with. So yeah, that's a point. So some tourists were making the decision to get back on the bus and try and hide in the bus, but he would literally go into, because all the buses had open doors and they were, mm. you know, just sat there stationary, he went on and he found more victims in each bus. He found people hiding in the car park. He saw people in large groups kind of huddling together and he would just fire pot shots into them. There's one particular uh, group of people which was with one of the lead security guards of Port Arthur where a young lady, uh, Nanette McCack, who was there with her two daughters, basically they were all talking amongst themselves while the shooting was taking place. Some of them wanted to stay hidden, other people wanted to make a run for it. So Nanette and her two uh, young girls made, made the decision to try and run for the exit and unfortunately that would prove to be a, a fatal decision in yeah, the hide behind the trees and stuff like that and he had no mercy whatsoever but that's the thing he did he some of these cases you see, you hear of you know they decide some people some people there's some reason decide they'll let live but he yeah. seemed to have absolutely no remorse for anyone so at approximately 1 40 p.m martin is back in his yellow volvo and is driving away from the port arthur heritage site towards the toll booth where he comes across nanette and her two daughters he slows the car down and opens his door nanette thinking that this is a concerned passerby looking to help her and her daughters to safety, approaches the car before realizing that she is face to face with the gunman. It's kind of clouded by the woodland towards the toll booth, but someone is filming the car leaving the site and then you kind of see through the trees, the car stopping. From other documentaries I've watched, people were shouting, it's, it's him, him. Yeah, it's you, him, you it's hear him. one man shout, it's him, which is, you can imagine just the horror. <sighs> yeah. So Martin orders her to get down on her knees, where he shoots her execution style in front of her two children. He then shoots one of the other young girls immediately. The second child tries to hide behind a tree and Martin follows her and also kills her. At approximately 1.45pm, he encounters a BMW at the entrance, which he cuts off in the road, preventing the car from getting past. An argument breaks up between the driver of the BMW and Martin, but Martin simply shoots the driver and turns his attention to the passengers in the car, who he also shoots and kills. After dragging the dead passengers out of the car, he transfers his weapons and ammunition from his yellow Volvo over to the BMW and sets off again on his murderous joyride. Approximately five minutes later, around 1.50pm, Martin pulls into a nearby petrol station where he comes across a white Toyota that was attempting to exit onto the motorway. Martin spots that there is a man and woman in the car and immediately jumps out, moving towards the side of the car where the woman is. The man, Glenn Pears, jumps out of the car in a bid to protect his girlfriend. Martin raises the gun towards Glenn and directs him towards the boot of the BMW. Glenn climbs in, fearing for his life, and Martin slams the boot shut. He then makes his way back to the white Toyota, where the female passenger, Zoe Hall, is frozen with fear. Martin shoots her three times, leaving her for dead in the service station car park. Ten minutes later, and Martin is speeding away from the service station in the stolen BMW, with his intentions set on returning to Seascape Cottage. En route, he fires out the car window, shooting oncoming vehicles and causing further injuries in the process. Upon arrival at Seascape Cottage, he drags his hostage inside and handcuffs him to the stair banister before rushing back to the driveway to set the BMW car on fire. With the thing about changing cars and stealing cars on the way, it's kind of to, you know, muddy the trail for people mm -hmm. to find you. So why then shoot out the car to make everyone aware that the car you're in is essentially your getaway car and then setting the car alight? Yeah. Make it obviously smoke and everything to alert people that there's something going on there. This just seems very odd. I get the impression he very much wanted like a standoff mm, yeah. rather than to get away. And he's obviously returned to that scene, to that seascape cottage. I know it had sentimental value to him because of his dad, but for some reason he's, he's brought it back there, which is not, again, not far from, from Port Arthur. So at around 2.10pm, a journalist from the ABC news station calls the seascape cottage by chance as they are attempting to build a picture from local residents of what is happening in the area. Imagine the odds. 
Not realising that the gunman himself is on the other end of the line after he calls himself Jamie, the reporter goes on to ask Jamie if he knows what is happening. Martin chillingly responds, oh, lots of fun, and then informs the journalist not to call again, and if she does, he will shoot the hostage. By this time, the police have locked onto Martin's location and arrive at Seascape Cottage at 2.30pm in an attempt to negotiate with a clearly agitated Martin, who keeps firing at random out of the property, preventing police from being able to approach. An hour later at 3.30pm and the first negotiation call is connected to Martin inside the guest house. He tells the police that it's like being on a Hawaiian holiday inside the cottage and that he needs to go shortly as he's making cups of tea and sandwiches for the hostage. See, he obviously didn't spend a lot of time in Hawaii. Not a lot of sandwiches? Well, there's that as well. Cups of tea? Yeah. Yeah. But just... Maybe iced tea. We'll play some of the audio as well. It's, it's He's obviously absolutely loving the power here and loving being a bit... He seems to be playing a comic book um, villain here. Yeah. He's just... Everything he says is so over the top and kind of just... Yeah, he's just buzzing from all this attention and it's very, very odd behaviour. And the fact that later, many, many days later, both he and his own mother would say, it wasn't even Martin. Mm. I just find that out, an outrageous claim to make. And there are some conspiracies which we'll go into, but yeah, he's, as Tom said, he is loving the power dynamic here. So another interesting thing to point out here is basically there wasn't a lot of police stationed around this island at this particular time or in this particular area when these phone calls were coming in. So the two policemen who decided it'd be better if they, if they went into different separate cars to go and try and find the assailant, which is an odd thing to do, but when you think about the time then, driving in two separate cars, they'd be able to cover more ground quicker and also just be able to respond to different you know different um, sightings, etc. So they split up and then one of them saw the bellowing of the smoke from the BMW and they drove over to um, the Seascape Cottage and when they got there, they were being shot at so they kind of hidden away in a bank there and they'll be there for many many hours to come so um, to go back to your point about him lighting a fire mm. i think that's intentional almost for them to say look this is where i am here i am yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, come and get me yeah and obviously they've never dealt with anything like this before yeah anything even close to it apparently martin would just randomly fire out from the windows it wasn't definitely he was aiming for aiming for them but it's a time before obviously social media so this kind of news of what as to where things were it was all done via phone calls but a lot of people were making phone calls at the same time and information can be kind of um, mixed up so yeah the situation is the police were there for a very long time this was ongoing just shooting out the window they're scared to move in fear of being shot and eventually more police would come and help to kind of manage this situation and they've also got a hostage to worry about as well, which just exactly, adds yeah. to the complexity of the of the issue. So please attempt to continue their negotiations with Martin. They do not seem to be getting through or connecting with him on any level. They are fearful the situation may not end well, and at 11.30pm, a coroner arrives on the scene. The standoff continues throughout the night, as does Martin's random firing of weapons. Police do not ever return fire, as they run the risk of also potentially harming the hostage if they do so. As the next morning creeps in, the police lay in wait, watching for any signs of movement from the cottage. So during the, um, you can't even really call them negotiations, can you? Because there was no real back and forth between the two. But his only real demand was to be transported via an army helicopter to the local airport. But yes, the police didn't meet these demands, not surprisingly. At around 8am on the following morning, a fire breaks out at Seascape Guesthouse. So Martin thinks this is the time, you know, another distraction he could do for the police and he thinks it's time he can make a run for it. But he accidentally sets himself on fire and runs out and that's when he's tackled by the police, which is, you can imagine that's quite the scene. So the police tackled him with his clothes and hair on fire at approximately 8.30am. He is immediately detained by the police and it's important to note that at some point during the 18 hours of negotiations, Martin shoots and kills Glenn Pears, making the body count within the guesthouse a total of three, David and Nolene and Glenn. Martin is suffering from some horrific burns as a result of catching fire and is immediately transferred to the Royal Hobart Hospital, which unfortunately is where the majority of the injured and deceased from Martin's shooting rampage has also been sent, which you can imagine just the anger and, oof, yeah, for anyone there wanting to just exact revenge on him. But I think, yeah, they, they cornered off a section for him to go in and not, no, none of them were to know that he was there. Yeah, there's that quite a famous photo of him sort of being apprehended by the police. You can't really, it doesn't look as if he's been on fire. Mm. Is that an okay thing to say? It, he no, does, yeah. no, I don't really yeah. know what that means. Hope it hurt though. Mine. So the total death count from that fatal day is 35 people, with the youngest being f just three years old and the oldest being 72. There were husband and wives, brothers, mother and daughters. It was just, yeah absolutely horrific. Many more people were also significantly injured. Martin Bryant remained in hospital for a week before being transferred directly to prison, where he was detained until his trial. After the police conducted a thorough search of his house, they concluded that this was certainly a planned attack as they came across boxes of ammunition, gun cleaning equipment and ammunition belts. 
However, when questioned by his own mother on the events of the 28th of April, Martin initially denied all knowledge, saying that he had been out surfing all day. And this is something that he and his mother would go, would both go on to uh, to claim was the case. But obviously, I mean, there's video evidence that he was there. There's people talking to him on the yeah. phone. During another police interview on the 4th of July 1996, Martin admits to owning the guns used in the attack and for also taking someone hostage, but maintains that he did not enter the Port Arthur site that day, nor or shoot anyone. And the thing that he was adamant of when he first arrived there was that he wanted to get on the 1.30 p.m. ferry to go out to the Isle of the Dead. But obviously he never actually even ended up getting a ticket for that. It's very dubious information that he's given to his lawyers and his mother at this point. So it's quite an infamous video of Martin being questioned by his lawyers and, and being spoken to where he's very much playing a game, laughing away, chuckling away. He's even like seeing some newspapers and magazines which have written about the case and he wants yeah. to know like, oh, how many were they killed? How many they said have, how the, they said that they've been killed? Yeah, and, he's, but he's also a smile on his face. But he's also saying, well, I wasn't there. I, it sounded like yeah. it was a bad day. Hope they get who did it. Yeah, exa- that kind of thing. And then he thinks they've stopped rolling the camera and he says this. Yeah, he says, I hope you, that you get, I hope you get that person. It's me. And like, he said, you should have been recording that. And they're like, we Good are. Good job you weren't recording or something like that. Yeah, no, well, we are recording, Martin. And then you see his face change. Yeah. So he he's playing a game massively with them constantly just. But yeah, it, that's a fascinating viewing, disturbing viewing, but his, his interview is available online. After continuing to deny that he was involved, Martin eventually gives in and admits that he had been planning the attack for weeks, starting with the Martins, the owners of the Seascape Cottage. He said he felt they deserved their deaths as they were the worst people in the world. So after numerous psychological tests and disagreements between mental health professionals, it was declared at Martin's sentencing that the accused is not criminally insane. There is no evidence to support that he has schizophrenia. The accused revels in the notoriety he receives. Which, yeah, like we said within that interview, he's soaking it all in and he wanted to be the kind of number one killer. Like, he wanted to get the most kills. And yeah. they, bring, they bring some of his weaponry into the room as well and he looks infatuated with those mm. rifles like oh that's a n- nice little gun and like you said at the start of the episode it's fascinating and he is fascinating there is so much depth to this case mm. and so much that you can look into but he is also just one of the most despicable like the, just the way he behaves when yeah. he thinks the cameras are off and when whilst they're on it's, it's, he's a hideous person apparently in one moment he'll be playing up like to the nurses who've had him very unsettling of course like could be one moment laughing and kind of like being very smug about all the kills but then next minute going Miss, could you get me a drink? I'm hungry. And like acting like a kid. Like he would go from being very childlike mm-hmm. to very kind of sinister. I think one of the policemen actually said he kind of wanted him to come at him so he could shoot him just because, yeah, he would have felt, would have thought twice about it. It's fascinating in the sense of just how you just can't believe someone could be capable of this. So after being advised by his lawyer to plead guilty, Martin does so and as a result receives 35 life sentences plus 1,035 years for other crimes committed in association with the attack. So that's just other things associated with it. And the judge openly states that Martin Bryant should remain in prison for the rest of his life. Martin becomes the first person to be sentenced without the possibility of parole in Australia. For Martin's first eight to nine months in prison, he is kept in almost complete solitary confinement purely for his own safety and to keep him away from harm that the other prisoners within the unit may inflict upon him. He is then moved to a secure mental health unit and on the 25th of March 2007, he attempts suicide for the first time by cutting his wrists. This attempt is not the last and he tried to commit suicide a total of eight times. As of January this year, Martin Bryant remains in prison at the maximum security Risdon Prison near Hobart. So that was the Port Arthur Massacre timeline. We're now going to get into some of the aftermath. The immediate aftermath of the Port Arthur Massacre called for a severe crackdown on weapons in Australia. The government established new laws under the National Firearms Agreement that heavily restricted the purchase and use of weapons, as well as introducing a national gun buyback scheme, which there's some staggering oh, pictures that, of, of yeah, all the... Yeah, the photo is insane, isn't it? Yeah, of all the, of all the um, weapons being bought back. I found an interesting quote from Barack Obama talking to Mark Maron about this case. He said, when Australia had a mass killing, it was just so shocking the entire country said, well, we're going to completely change our gun laws, and they did. And it hasn't happened since, which is, you know, compared to obviously America, which he's, he's talking about there. They thought we can't have this happening again. Let's mm-hmm. make make a change. There was some people um, in rural parts, you know, hunting, thinking, why are we being punished for one person's actions? But I think most people believe it was the best way was just to kind of clear out as much as they possibly could. Yeah, much like Hungerford and Dunblane over here. 
The Port Arthur site reopened shortly after the attack. However, the cafe and the gift shop were soon knocked down, and to this day, it remains as a memorial area designed for reflection. Tourists still flock to the site to this day, but they are advised to refrain from asking members of the staff directly about the shootings, and they were referred towards the commemorative plaque at the memorial site instead. Yeah, imagine going there and asking people about it. When I went to Vegas, like literally a couple of days after yeah. that festival shooting, it was not that I was asking questions. Obviously, we went and we had a look, but the ta- oh, did I tell you about the taxi driver mm. who was just like, ask me anything, man? And he was like a bit of a conspiracy theorist. But I guess you're going to get with any case, and especially this case, I mean, I hadn't heard of it before, really, in any detail before the audience vote, so I mm. wasn't as aware, but there must be people with that morbid curiosity who even if they do go somewhere where it's a, a place to pay your respects and, and to have like quiet quiet reflection, I'm sure you're still going to get the odd handful of people that are like, so did that happen here? Did this happen there? Where was he? Where did he park? Just listen to a podcast. Yeah, that's a great advice. So conspiracy theorists state that Martin Bryant was not solely responsible for the gun attacks. There's always, I feel like with a mass shooting, there's always this conspiracy at Port Arthur that day. And they believe that the whole thing was orchestrated in a bid to restrict gun laws. And we've heard that many, many times before. There are also reports that Martin Bryant couldn't have been the shooter as he is apparently left handed, whereas the shooter was reported as shooting with his right hand. Yeah, another thing I heard was that because he was shooting from the hip and he got so many hits, it's like that's a really extremely hard way to shoot and kill people. So the people believe that they can't have beat him, just just him shooting because the amount of deaths that happened. Are they not going to listen to all the um, eyewitness accounts and the video footage of Ben? Just him? I'm just hey, whoa, <laughs> that's, not my, that's not my theory. Sorry, man. In popular culture, the 1996 events have been recently depicted in the 2021 film Nitch Ram, which is Martin backwards. Do you notice that, Ben? Yeah, it's in my notes. Is it? That's yeah. brilliant. Well done. Thank you. The movie is based on the life of Martin Bryant and the backstory and lead up to those fatal shootings. Actor Caleb Landry Jones plays the role of Martin, of which he won the Cannes Film Festival Award for Best Actor. That, again, is links back to that thing we said at the start where locals and, and nationals won't even say his name. So that's mm. why they decided to call it Nitrum. The film itself received quite a lot of pushback from Tasmanians. It felt it was distasteful and feared it would reopen old wounds and further conspiracy theories. It was actually made by the same people that made Snowtown. Oh. Yeah, which received similar controversy at the time. Very good film, Snowtown. So yeah, maybe I need uh, to go watch this. I need to watch, yeah. No, I need to watch. I need to. And yeah. then you've got wasps and now spiders as well. So spiders in Snowtown and wasps in Port Arthur, in a way. So we talked about different assessments made on Martin Bryant. In an examination after the massacre, forensic psychiatrist Ian Joblin found that Bryant had a borderline intellectual disability, scoring an IQ of 66, which is equivalent to an 11-year-old. I did an extra little bit of digging this week, which I'm annoyed at myself that I didn't bring this up during the episode last week where we covered the Hungerford Massacre. But for perspective on this case, which I found extraordinary, the Hungerford Massacre claimed one more victim than the Columbine school shootings and one less victim than Nicholas Cruz, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. Whereas this case that we've covered this week, the Port Arthur Massacre, claimed two more victims than both the Hungerford Massacre and the Parkland shooting combined. Then I I did a bit more digging and I wanted to ask you boys, Dan's already clicked the link so I can't ask him, but I'll ask you. I mean, I'll throw it to Dan, but if he gets the right answer, no one can trust it. Of the 10 deadliest mass shootings in history... How many of them do you think took place in America? Nine. Two. All right, well, we can't trust him. It's two. That is surprising. Yeah, Vegas and um, the Orlando nightclub shooting in 2016. So as with many of the, the mass shooting cases that we cover, there is so much detail. There are so many different accounts from survivors, witness testimonies where they're, they're, they talk in more detail about the exact footsteps of the perpetrator, but also the heroes of that day. There's so much other material out there in terms of reading materials, podcasts, documentaries that, that are available. We definitely implore you to check those out. But it, it will it will go down and still goes down as to the case that changed Australia forever. It was one, obviously, we both kind of had limited knowledge of before going on with the research for this one. But it's I found this one really, really particularly disturbing and upsetting. Yeah, the, um, the lawyer from Martin Bryant would go on to say, you know, he still, that's what an interview with him. And he said he still feels very affected by the case. And yeah. he still kind of felt, he felt some weird sympathy for Martin. Yeah, he just, he just got in his head, basically. And he felt manipulated. He felt like he was another victim of him. I mean, there's reports now of Martin in prison. He said his mum says he's gained a lot of weight, and online apparently he gained weight from uh, delivering sexual favours for chocolate. So, uh, 
What a way to go. Yeah, there's that very recent photo that's allegedly of him. Yeah. Does not look like the same person. Because, yeah, that was the other thing. In the 60 Minutes Australia, they talk in a lot of detail about how he was this, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy with seemingly the world at his feet. He was a handsome guy growing up and he mm. could have potentially had it all. His internal self did not match his exterior self. Mm. And I think that's where it, there's a, then obviously... He's had very little consequence as a result of his actions growing up. Well, like there's red flags about him saying he so, wants to go around shooting people. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's, yeah, it's easy for us to say, obviously, hindsight and everything like that. But it, you can't help but feel that there's some moments there, definitely, where people could have, could have been intervened. And hopefully there's things in place now that will, you know, be intervened in their situations. So, Ben, is it time for a little bit of light relief? If we, if we may. If we may. So it's time for some look What does it look like? That looks like a bit like that. So it looks a bit like it. Straight off the bat, mine uh, this week are terrible. So there you go. Okay. Yeah, I'm not happy with either of mine. One of them's too complimentary. You actually pointed one out and said, I bet this is yours, which it wasn't, which was better than the ones I picked. No, really? Yeah, so that's, sure. that's how bad it is. So halfway through this episode, we went to get some lunch and I saw Erling Harland. Harland yeah. And I thought that was Tom's. I was pretty sure that was going to be his lucky. No, it's not. Mine's worse than that. But do you want to start or do you want to start with mine because they're bad? How many first? have you got? Sorry? I've got two. Well, I've got three, so we could go one me? me, one you, one me. Why not? So uh, this week, I've got mixed feelings about my three. I think one you might like, specifically you, Tom, might like. But my first one, this lookalike found me. Okay, yeah, and yeah. I'll elaborate on that. I had a mouthful of water there, I forgot. Yeah. So I was sat doing my research midweek. I've got, had new, the... I've got a new one now. Okay, fantastic. I bet it's going to be the same as you now. Go on, sorry. Sat doing my research midweek, flip open Instagram. I follow James Smith, personal trainer, who I think has a... Very similar voice to Dan. I think they've got this, they share the same tonality, which is a compliment to, to both of them because they've both got great voices. Anyway, he had a fitness model called Sean Stafford on his podcast, and it was at the very top of my uh, Instagram feed. While I also had a Port Arthur doc on the telly, and I had to do a double take. Uh, it's, the, it's the face. Did you, did you double take thinking that um, he was interviewing him? No, I just thought that's a bit weird. Isn't it looks it? a bit more like for, uh, Torres. But... Yeah, Torres vibe. Yeah. Well, even he looks like Torres. Yeah, him, him, yeah. So that's my first one. Yep, nice. Uh, the one I just thought then is not right. Doesn't look good. It's just a blonde head guy. Who is it? It was Robbie Savage. Um, this is a massive compliment to um, Martin. Uh, it's just, and this is the one I thought you might have. It's just Heath Ledger, which is just lazy. It's just an Australian guy with, with long hair. I think Heath could have played him well. But. Yeah. Okay, my next one is uh, actually uh, one of the survivors, Ian Kingston. I actually get a, a really big Tony Soprano vibe. <laughs> Oh, he looks more like um, one of the other uh, bosses. Oh, Johnny Sack. Yeah, a bit like him. A little bit. Or the face. My last one, if you bleached this guy's hair, yeah, it would help a lot. Dan Hawkins from The Darkness. Yeah, that's pretty good. Not, so, not great. Not proud of my lookalikes this week. They've been... Here's my one that I think you're going to like. It wasn't the Sopranos one. This is a bit more niche as well, but in this particular photo, I feel like... Martin Bryant could be the idiot son of the Heaven's Gate leader, Marshall Applewhite. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Ooh, tell you what. Have you got one? I tell you what, Ben, that's inspired me. Come he also looks very James Holmes in that. Doesn't he look like? Like Lauren Harris. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so Lauren Harris, famous when she was young, um, being an antiques person on TV and then she's on Celebrity Big Brother I think yeah. once she's claimed to have had Great sexual spot. relations with Russell Brand so it looks that one that you said no, it looks a little bit like that one Lauren yeah Harris. yeah good but, shout pff, I mean I'm not yeah I think you, one of yours probably wins but yes guys only two episodes left of this series ooh only two left and there are mm. some big big cases you don't know what they are do you the last one is uh, as I said it's, a very, it's, a, it's an interesting one a very mm. interesting one and then I think you guys will be very happy with the next one but that's all I'm going to say about that Big thank you to this week's sponsor, Dead Happy. Um, if you just can't wait until next week, which is a big, big case, we've got lots of little big cases over on Patreon. Some are actually really big cases over on Patreon as well, as we've pointed out, which is patreon.com forward slash goodmurderapod. And there's video episodes, audio episodes. At the time of recording, 83, 84 episodes. I think so, Ben. Well, the year um, were you born? 84, 85, about 85, I think. 89. Wow. Oh, yeah. Really? Same year as you. That doesn't add up. Um, but yes, guys. Sorry? Between us. It's just a couple, couple of months between, between us. us. I'm just trying to fit the camera. Oh, go on then. Do you know what we did a podcast? And also, don't forget to go onto our store for the casualty stock out mm. now, half price. Hopefully, there's still some available. Great now. Christmas gift. That, isn't it just? And the Halloween bundle. Mm. The cozy Ooh. night. Halloween bundle, which, you know, for a cozy night in a little candle, a little mug, tote bag full of sweets. Yes, please. Two. 
So why not help yourself to you that? Can buy two bundles. There's no limit on bundles. Bundles are fun. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. And until next time, we always say... We say this all <laughs> the time. <laughs> I thought not. it was me. I thought it was me. And guys, like we always say... We say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. I mean, can you still even buy harnesses for kids? I don't think that's the bad the bad part. No, well, there's a, I was just getting started. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, um, Unless it's sh- shooting parrots with guns. It don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, don't shoot parrots again. Trilbies, not trilbies, obviously, but um, Fazendas, not for f- fedoras. Fazendas is a restaurant, <laughs> unless it's um, cravats. Yeah, bringing cravat back. Unless it's you know, I did I did feel bad about the plane part and not having anyone to talk to, but that's don't do. Get a pen pal. Yeah, cheaper. Um, don't befriend a well, do befriend a anyway, mysterious guys. millionaire, anyway, quirky millionaire, but make sure. She looks after herself See and her guys. mother See and the guys. house and the mansion and the pet. See you. See you guys. All best. Two pit. Before casually bending down to the sports bag on the ground, I listed out an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. Sorry, did you just fart, Ben? Mm. Sorry, Tom. That's one for the paper reel. W- which part? Just before casually bending down. When you said casually bending down, I don't know what happened, but I fought it. got some poo dust out. Yeah.